Venerable Ajahn Mun died last night. Have you heard about it, Mother? The provincial radio station broadcast this morning at eight o'clock, saying, Puritatta Tera, who is the most widely renowned amongst those who practice the way of Tamma in this present age, died at 2.23 a.m. in Watsu Tawasa in the province of Zagonnakun. This is all I heard before I ran out to let other people know, and I ran straight here to let Kun Ma and the others here know, for I was afraid you may not have heard it yet. Having heard a second confirmation of Venerable John's death, all of them in the nunnery burst into tears once again, after the first time earlier on when Kun Mea Gao told them of her nimitta. Kun Mea had knowledge of all sorts of strange things in her samati, things which were most unusual in all aspects, and it seems that she had been engrossed in and attached to this kind of knowledge for more than ten years. If on any day she did her pawana and had no experience of various things by way of samati pawana, she would consider that she had gained no value from her pawana at all that day. She had become attached to this way of practice until it was deeply ingrained in her heart that seeing all sorts of nimittas was the true path and fruit of pawana. Later on, a bhikkhu who was a follower of Venerable Ajahn Mun went to stay there for the Vassa season, and he trained and taught her both about nimittas and about other things as well, until she became confident and knew how to deal with samati nimittas and how to go in another direction, which is the direction of the path and fruition, Maggapala, until her way became smooth and elegant the whole time without going to excess in some directions, as had previously been the case. She was therefore ready to accept the cure and to change her ways, and she saw the results of it to her own satisfaction, no longer being either elated or depressed in accordance with whatever nimittas arose. For she stood firm with sati and banya as the way to go forward towards freedom from danger and the destruction of dukkha. In this way, she continued to go on with ease and convenience in her practice, right up to the present day, and her reactions to her samati nimittas ceased to be a problem to her from then on. In fact, this kind of samati has become an important factor in bringing value to herself and others round about. She has had knowledge of many strange things which most people who practice the way never come across. Knowledge of happenings in the past and future, knowledge of pretas, putas, ghosts, devatas, and knowledge of various kinds of beings in heavenly bodies, all of these she knew about well. But in order to give an idea of what is meant by the eye and the dewa heart of someone who practices the way and who has strong tendencies of character in this direction, I will give some brief examples. One night, Gunmea was sitting in Pawana, and there appeared before her an animal which had come in the guise of a man to visit her. It was wailing and bemoaning its fate, saying how it had been an animal which they looked after in this village, but it had never been treated well and kindly by its master. He had put it to work at pulling his plough and wagons very often, but instead of appreciating what it did, he used to torment it and beat it while it was working and at other times as well. Finally it was led to a tree where it was tied up and slaughtered and cut up for its meat, which was a fierce, cruel, and inhuman act. Before it died, it had to put up with unbearable torment and pain, and it died not wanting to die. When it came to the nun, it seemed to be full of hate and vengeance for its previous owner, and so strong was it that it could not find any resting place for its ditta. It had wandered about all twisted up and distorted, until it came to Kunmea for help in alleviating its dukkha, and to ask for some share in her merit and virtue. Badami, so that it may be born as a human being next time, and so that it may breathe freely and shed some of its dukkha, and not have to be forced and compelled to accept such punishment as it has just recently had to put up with. It said how being born as an animal was very hard with too much torment, for it had to put up with being made to do various things and being tortured in various ways, both by people and animals as well. Being born as a human being is far better than being born as an animal, even when one is poor and hard up, and one can only get enough to eat about every third day, 
for an animal gets only dukkha, difficulty, and torment all the time. Kunmea then questioned the man who was truly a buffalo, saying, Why do you say that your master did not appreciate your value and virtue, and that he has no humanity in his heart, that he was so cruel to you in various ways and killed you, until now you are full of hate and vengeance against him? Could it be that you were not so good, and that you used to go about stealing things which people had planted in their fields and near the fences of their plantations and eating them? Why normally should anyone take you and beat you and torment you and then go and kill you? People round about here mostly seem to be good people with a fair humanity in them, and one can feel reasonably confident of their behavior. Why then should they do such a thing to you if you were blameless? It seems to me that you must have gone about doing bad things, such as I have said, for them to have acted like that, and to have felt justified in doing what they did to you. Did you not act in some of those ways as I said? He replied with a sorrowful heart, It was because I was so hungry and starving, just due to my mouth and stomach, which are so important to animals of this world. If I saw anything that looked like food and sustenance, as soon as it reached my mouth, I would grab it or nibble away at it in the way that animals do. I had no knowledge of what belonged to who or whether anyone was anxiously looking after anything. If I had known some of the language which people spoke, I probably would not have done this, nor would I have been born as an animal for them to beat and slaughter, as happened just a short while ago. But then, people are more intelligent than animals, and they should be more considerate and forgiving, and not act in ways that are too repressive, which are contrary to the moral status, see le tamma, and behavior of a human being. A good person would not act in this way which is despicable and vulgar and undermines the status of his own birth. Such a person is a good person with moral integrity who is not likely to bring himself to do an act such as this. What Venerable Mother said about people round here being good and with fair humanity in them is true. But as for the person who was my master, he is not a good person with humane qualities in his heart, and not worthy of the human race. He is just a scum of the earth who happens to have been born as a person, and he has a fierce and cruel heart, and he will act like that with everything, and I cannot forgive him. For even with other people, he is quite capable of doing harm to them, not to mention animals who are in a much more unfortunate situation." Kunmea then gave it some teaching with metta and sympathy, and she shared her merit with this animal, with a heart full of kindness and compassion, while giving it the moral precepts and her blessing, saying, May the virtue and the result of the metta which I share with you guard you, nourish you, promote you, and lead you to the path which gives those qualities to gain birth in a state of happiness, where you may have the food of the gods and golden mansions to live in and enjoy. As soon as it had received her boon by saying Satu, it took leave of the nun in a spirit of brightness, joy, and happiness, as though it was off to be born in that state and place which it wished for right away. After daybreak, Kunmea called her nephew from his home and quietly told him what happened the previous night. She then asked him to go and find out about this man who had killed the buffalo and what had happened. Then she said, But you must not let anyone know that I have asked you to find out about this. I am afraid he would be ashamed in the face of what I know, or he may entertain bad thoughts about us, which will increase his evil gumma far beyond what it is now. After she had finished, her nephew immediately replied to her, for he lived in the same village as that man and knew all about it saying, Venerable Mother, there is no need for me to spend a lot of time finding out about this, for last night, about 8 p.m., he led his buffalo out and killed it. The cries of the buffalo in its dukkha and torment could be heard everywhere. After he had finished, he took its meat and had a party with his friends, feasting on it and making a lot of noise, yelling, shouting, laughing, and carousing, until it had almost reached dawn. I doubt whether they have even woken up yet in that household, but all this I know for a fact, so there is no need to waste time making any investigations. 
This incident was one which Gun Mea told me about, and it is notable in that the appearance of the Nimitta took place the same night as the incident, although it appeared late at night when all was quiet, which was a little time after the incident itself. This whole incident is one which we who are yet within the realm of Vakta, Sangsara, should think about, for it is something that could happen to any of us, regardless of time, place, or personal status. The next story concerns an incident with a forest pig, a wild boar. This story is strange and unusual in a special way, but we must start at the beginning. This wild boar was wandering in search of food around the edge of the mountain on its own, without thinking that there would be anybody lying in wait for it, because that district was very far away from any villages. It is probable that the hunter was waiting there to shoot any forest animals that came to drink water from a rock pond at the foot of this hill, and that it was also the gumma of this wild boar to go there. The wild boar would have laid down to wait for a while, before going down to drink in this pond. Then as soon as it had reached the water, it was shot and killed. In the early hours of the morning, shortly before dawn, the wild boar came to Kunme, who was sitting in Samati Pawana. It came in the form of a man, as did the buffalo in the previous incident. Kunme asked, What is the reason, or what trouble are you in, that you have come to see me? The pig man told her the story of why he had come, saying, I was killed by a hunter when I went to drink some water, for I was thirsty. Kunmea then asked, When you went to take a drink, were you not cautious and wary of the danger to you? Yes, he replied, I have always been cautious, and have never let my guard drop for fear of danger. Life as an animal such as I was is very difficult, and one has no freedom in oneself. Wherever one goes, there is nothing but danger and predators all round one, and I always had to be very watchful, but even so I was shot and killed. However, the fact of my death does not concern me so much as being born again. I am afraid of being born as an animal once again, which is a life full of dukkha and torment, because one must suffer hunger and privation, and also be constantly on guard against danger, all of which causes much dukkha. So one's life becomes a life of mistrust and watchfulness everywhere, with no place to eat, sleep, and live peacefully relaxed. The reason why I have made the effort to come here is because of the fear of being born again in the wrong circumstances without being able to avoid it. I don't have the merit to help raise me up and support me. Therefore, I made a great effort to come here in the hope of taking refuge in the merit and perfections of Venerable Mother, who has practiced the way of Tamma and has such merit as supports the world. I beg you to be kind and benevolent, and to bestow your blessings on this poor creature lacking in meritorious characteristics. Then I may be able to take birth in the state which I hope for. I have no wealth of virtue in me which could give me any confidence and assurance of my future state. All I have is the flesh and skin of my body which was killed tonight to offer as a gift of Tamma reverence to you, who uphold Tamma and live the holy life. So I came to pay respect to you, to tell you my reason for coming, and also to implore you to help me. For when the people bring the parts of my body, both the valuable internal organs and the meat and skin and external parts, to give to you, I implore you, Venerable Mother, to partake and eat some of it with metta for me. Then the merit which comes from this gift may act to help and support me, so that I may be born as a human being in my next life, which is what I most desire. What I would really like to offer you are the internal organs of the wild boar which died and which was myself. But people are more greedy than animals, and I fear that the best parts they will rather keep for themselves than use to make merits. That they will not bring them to you, afraid that they won't experience the flavor of them, and being driven to do this by their own gilesis of greed. So I am very afraid and anxious that this, my final gift to you, may not be as I would wish it to be. Kunmea then kindly taught him, gave him the five precepts, the sila, gave him her blessing, shared out some of her merit with him with the hope that he may be born in accordance with his aspiration. After receiving the thanksgiving, Anumodana, for his act of merit, he took leave of her and went his way. After daybreak, 
Kun Mare quietly told the others, saying, I was sitting in Samati Pawana late at night, when at about three o'clock a nimitta arose of a man who came to me in a manner that spoke of much dukkha and torment in his heart. When asked about his visit, he said that he had been a wild boar living in the hills for many years. But tonight, when he went to take a drink of water in a rocky pool on the side of the hill, he was shot and killed by a man who lives in a nearby village and who was sitting close by. From having been in the form of the wild boar, he had died and came to me as an emitta, taking the form of a man. He said he had come because he wanted to offer his body and its parts, which had been killed, as dana to us, so that we should take his flesh and skin and eat it as food. As a result of doing this, he hoped that he would be born as a human being in his next life. I have told you the main facts of this incident so that you shall know about it beforehand, so that when the people bring flesh and meat and whatever else to give us, we should accept it, and be kind enough to eat it as well, so that the merit from it may help him to be born as a human being in his next life. I don't know why this took place. I have never come across anything like this before, that an animal has wanted to make merit by giving its own meat like this wild boar has done. That is, if it is true. So we must wait and see whether it is true or not, and we should know very soon. If we think of the order in which these events occurred, it was really quite amazing and remarkable how, before long, at about eight o'clock in the morning, two or three women came with the wife of the hunter, whom the wild boar had named as the man who killed him. One of them brought some pig meat to give to the nuns, and when they saw it, they thought that this must surely be the meat of that wild boar. When they asked these people about this meat and where it came from, the whole story was in accordance with what Kunme had told them right through, even to the name of the hunter who had shot him. These are the kinds of nimittas that arise in some people who practice samati, and the problems that arise from samati are numerous, as we have already said. This is enough about samati, so we will finish here. The Problems That Arise With Wisdom As for the problems which arise from the levels of wisdom, banya, they are far more numerous than those of samati, as well as being much more profound and intricate. They can arise any day, any time, without forewarning, and one must use wisdom to unravel them, to analyze them, and to solve them one by one. Otherwise, there is no way to clear them and to go beyond them, and if one is still unable to go beyond them, they will go on making one perplexed and stupefied, sometimes for days at a time. Since each problem differs in its nature and difficulty, those who practice the way must be people who are naturally inclined to contemplation and analysis within themselves, without needing anyone to coerce or compel them. Each problem that arises acts as if it were a stimulus to stir up mindfulness and wisdom, waking oneself up. The path of mindfulness and wisdom may be considered to extend from the level of the contemplation of loathsomeness, asupa, up to the levels of the contemplation of the factors of mind, namatamma, which are the more subtle levels. At this point, the one who practices the way is bound to be rousing up problems and questions, as well as wisdom, far more than at any stage he has passed through before. But if he believes that he has a basic ground of his chitta and tamma, which are already subtle and skillful in the tamma of loathsomeness, as well as the nama tamma, which are feeling, vedana, memory, sanya, thought processes, sankara, and consciousness, vinyana, yet no problems arise to trouble the heart at all, and he prides himself that he is in the group of those who go the way of sukha patibada, easy practice, he will, in fact, be in the group of those who are complacent and negligent in doing the practice for extracting the taproot and all the smaller roots, or all the roots and fundamental source of all the gilesas without realizing it. For the process of curing the gilesas by means of the practice, from the beginning of samadhi up to the various levels of banya, going up step by step, will normally be accompanied by many problems and questions which percolate into the practice all the way along. But they also arouse and stir up mindfulness and wisdom, thereby making us wake up. One who practices tamma, 
and who never has any problems or questions arising at all, is sure to be practicing in a way that is too easy and relaxed, as if those questions were bits of meat of the type which the chopping block is afraid to take on, and it is not courageous enough to bring them out to be chopped up. One fears that this is just his negligence and complacency, or delusion, moha, that makes him afraid, so that he doesn't have the courage to bring these questions to be accounted for. He is afraid that it will destroy all the minions of Moha who are so numerous, breaking their enclosure and dispersing them all into oblivion. In particular, the levels of wisdom, for those who have reached them, are bound to be a warehouse full of questions from all sorts of viewpoints which should arise continually all the time. When these questions or problems arise, mindfulness and wisdom cannot remain quiet and inactive, because they are stirred up by the incessant nagging of the problems until they cannot put up with it any more and must go to work to examine, to investigate, and to solve them, and get rid of them one by one. This means that every time one solves any problem, one also takes a step forward and goes beyond that problem. Each time that a problem is solved, all sorts of skills and methods will come to one. They arise continually from mindfulness and wisdom, which have been put to work to dig up, to search, and to unravel them. The way of practice which has no problems and questions arising at all is indicative of complacency in the one who is doing the practice, and it shows that he is not looking for the way to get free with the concern for it that he should have. This is because, generally speaking, Problems and questions arise from contemplation and thought searching for causes. The citta is the one that always receives the results of good and bad causes, and when one looks into them and thinks about them, one is almost bound to come across things which bring up questions and problems. For someone who is interested in developing wisdom, the means of cutting off the kilesas, these problems are the means of arousing wisdom when he reaches that point in the future. Therefore, my own view of this, of which I feel quite convinced, is that anyone who practices the way of tamma and who has no problems or questions arising from his practice at all, from the levels of samadhi onwards, is not practicing for the purpose of gaining true wisdom and clear understanding in the noble truths, such a tamma, and he will not be able to find the way to freedom. This is because the noble truth which binds down the citta and which has uprising, samudaya, as its most important characteristic, is the source of all the problems and confusions which arouse or disturb us. On the other hand, the path, magga, has right view, samadirti, and right attitude of mind, samasangappa, as its most important characteristics, for these are the source of wisdom, banya, at all levels, and this is what solves the questions which arise from Samudaya Satcha. Both of these Tamma principles are bound to perform their respective functions to their utmost at their present level, before they can go on further beyond the present level or basis of each one respectively. The work that mindfulness and wisdom, Satipanya, does in connection with Samudaya, uprising, the root cause of all these problems, is what is meant by the arousing of problems and questions. It is also what is meant by the curing of problems, as it is called amongst those who practice the way of Pawana. Therefore, those who have already gone some way towards the attainment of calm, Samadhi, should steadily begin to use wisdom to search out the ways of cause and effect from this time on. Or one may say that they should begin to search and research into the why and wherefore of things so as to give rise to questions, so that their wisdom shall have some work to do and not be out of work and idle, which is the way of a lazy person who is used to being contented and complacent. This is the meaning of moha, the delusion which lulls them into a waking sleep the whole time out of which, from day to day, they never wake at all. This is not the path of samadhi and banya, not the way to gain that freedom which is gained by those who follow the principles of curing the kilesas by means of sati and banya. But it is not possible to give details of what perplexities and problems should arise, what kind of characteristics they should have, or what kind of wisdom should be used to cure what kind of problem, and by the use of what method. All such things must depend on the technique or skill of each individual, who must think out and make up his own methods to suit the circumstances and situations which he is faced with each time and in each case. 
because in regard to such problems and perplexing things, as well as the wisdom itself, there are innumerable different kinds, and they hop and change about in accordance with the deceptive tricks of the uprising, Samudaya, Kilesas, and the skillfulness of Sati and Banya. Therefore, I have only put down what is essential, without making it too involved and long-winded, which might discourage the reader before he has started to do any of it in practice. However, in the way of practice in the heart, which is aimed at getting at the truth of causes and their results, there is bound to be perplexity as well as wisdom, and these two are always enemies to each other, and they remain so until the ultimate resolution of causes and their results has been fully attained. In consequence, all problems and perplexities then die away and disappear, whether they are about the uprising, samudaya, or about the path, magga, which is the one that cures it. All of you who practice the way should therefore be resolute and constant in maintaining mindfulness and wisdom, for they are the factors which will show up the reasons behind the various aspects of the problems which arise and come to you in the way of samadhi and the way of contemplative thought or wisdom. This will enable you to reveal the full meaning of these problems with all the reasons for them, and this is the way to progress in tamma. The kilesas with which each of these problems are permeated will also drop away and dissolve as soon as each problem is solved and dispersed. I feel that this is enough explanation about the problems and questions that should arise from the way of samati and banya to act as a guide to those who are interested. So I shall end here.